Hello everyone and welcome back to the Tent of Abraham. I'm Tamir Kreisman from Israel and this is Parashat Chukat. This is the statue, Numbers 19 to 22, 1. And this one is called Thy Rod and Thy Staff. So, well last week for us was Parashat Korach. It's about 30 years for the children of Israel. You see, some time had passed and now they're in their final stages of entering the land of Israel. Now, as we know, we're coming closer to the end of the book of Bamidbal, the book of Numbers. And then the book of Deuteronomy is about five weeks out from the timeline before the death of Moses. In the uh, parashot of the Torah, we know that there are stories, there are laws, there are secrets, there are morals, right? This parasha, it has them all. So the stories you can read for yourselves, as well as the laws, do this, don't do that. The secrets I might be able to help and explain, but the, the morals. See, we live by these. This is really taking everything into account, putting it all together. These have to hit us so hard, really, for anything to count. And that's why 10 people can listen to the same class, and it'll hit each and every one of them differently, in their own individual way. It's for real God speaking to us on the most personal levels. This is our own personal vaikra, if you will. It's your call. God is calling to you within whatever words that are spoken. It's also the true reasoning behind what is seen. Just like reading about the sacrifices in Leviticus. I thoroughly enjoyed the study of the book of Leviticus this year. Although it may seem boring, most people around the world, Bible students, if you will, I call them Bible students because that's exactly what it is, they tend to skip over Leviticus because it's passe, it's not relevant. But the more you learn about it, the more you understand the purpose of each and every sacrifice, and what you take with you is a more general and yet a deeper understanding that God wishes to connect with his children through the sacrifices, which is why they are called korbanot, from the word karov, lehakriv, to draw near. That's you, not necessarily the animal. We also know that the ultimate purpose of all of creation is teshuvah. Within the word teshuvah, which in modern day Hebrew means answer, she'ela is a question, teshuvah is answer, comes the word lashuv, to return, to return to where we came from originally, both physically but also spiritually. Although we did not take part in the sin of Gan Eden and the Garden of Eden, we have the merit of fixing it, since the residue is still in the world. Each and every person has a tikkun, a correction to make in this world to try and correct the first sin from the Garden of Eden. And that's why the words we read at the end of the book of Lamentations are so powerful. And it's one of the most difficult reads you're going to ever have to read in the Torah. It makes you be heartbreaking. Restore us to you, O Lord, that we may be restored. Renew our days as of old. Hashivenu Adonai Elecha Venashuva Chadesh Yamenu Kekedim. Everything is about returning, Tshuva, rectification. Even when a sinless child is born into the world, this world has sin for that specific child to correct. Whether they are being taken as children or grow up and complete their task. Maybe the second or third time around. Meaning that just like we discussed the opportunity for Datan and Aviram last week to come back as bulls to be sacrificed to glorify the name of God, which is the opposite of what, would hap of what happened, I, I realize many of you also have a problem with this, yes? The understanding this concept. So I'll try and explain it as simple as I can, the whole reincarnation thing, right? We do not understand the soul. Okay, we barely understand the physical human body, so give me a break with the whole soul. It's not just one thing, it's not a ghost in the shell type of situation. Okay, most of your soul isn't even here, it's there. Your, whole, your soul is 100% um, uh, pure. It's 100% spirit, it's barely anything to do with this world. This is a physical world. But we know that a husband and wife, who are soulmates, are actually the same soul. 
So how could one soul be in more than one place at the same time? See what I'm saying? Because the soul is not bound by space and time. And if anything is not bound by space and time, you cannot fully grasp it because you are bound by space and time. So no one can. So we know that when you pray, for instance, you are not the same even five minutes later. You have just changed your position. Your soul was just elevated to a different place in the spiritual realm, thereby elevating your nefesh in the process. Or also, by elevating your nefesh, you elevate your soul in the process. The point is it happens simultaneously. They work together. This we may be able to somewhat comprehend. It makes a little bit more sense. We also know that uh, Pinchas, for instance, Pinchas, he became Elijah. We know that Enoch became Metatron. And we know even that Abel, as in Cain and Abel, became Moses. Each one of them had a different level of consciousness. It's not like the full memories were there. Okay, Again, we're speaking of different parts of a specific soul that need correction until the soul is yet again perfected. So last year we discussed briefly that the place where the earth opened its mouth to swallow Korach and his camp was exactly the same spot where the ground absorbed Abel's blood and was crying out to God. Those, in other words, when you heard, when the children of Israel say they heard their screams, it was the screams of their, of their brother's blood down there, i.e. Abel. But now a correction was made since Moses' blood was not taken down, but rather his aggressors in this case, and unfortunately his brothers. Brothers, brothers, reversed over there. So we are given these second or third chances out of mercy in order for us to complete our tasks. And furthermore, your soul, your neshama, chose its tikkun and burden in this life. We also discussed this. You stand before God, before the soul enters a body, and God's like, so... What tikkun would you like to make for the world? And soul's like, I want to make this and this and that. Are you sure? It's tough. Bring it. Okay. And here we go. The bigger the struggle, the bigger the tikkun. And I'm sorry, but I don't know any man who struggled more than Moshe Rabbeinu. There is no man who struggled more than him. He got it from the people and he got it from God. He was the rock that held the whole thing together. While he was alive, the angel of the Lord was not needed since Moses became the angel, the messenger of the Lord. He was the Lord's anointed, the redeemer of Israel, and the children of Israel never let him rest. Every week we come back and we read something else that either they did or said to break this man. But make no mistake, he was far from broken. What does it say in Deuteronomy 34? Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye had not dimmed, nor had he lost his natural freshness, it says. Moshe ben me'av eslim shana b'moto, lo kahata eno velo nas lecho. He was the same as he was 20 years old. He could have gone on. He never lost his sharpness. He could have lived forever. But the 40 years that he did everything for Israel that he could, again, this started way before, but for 40 years, he was in it. He was in the thick of it. He was indeed the faithful shepherd of a very, very willful flock. And this is no ordinary shepherd, as even he himself had a shepherd. Nor is this an ordinary flock, as they saw almost everything that he did. Remember, they saw everything that he did except for what he saw on Mount Sinai. So like I said before, when they saw the voices on Har Sinai, they saw the voices. Do you, what does a voice look like? Hmm? No, we don't know what it looks like, but they did. The lowest of them was elevated to the highest levels in this physical world because no one else in existence thus far has seen that. Some of you might have a problem with that. When I made the uh, comparison between the lowest person in Israel and the prophet Yechezkel, it's not on a, the, uh, the same level at all. You must understand. Mount Sinai was a whole nother level. It was heaven coming down to earth. Okay? It was the spiritual fusing with the physical for that period of time so that they can understand, sort of begin to comprehend what God was. And yet still God said, remember, you saw no image through the smoke. You saw nothing. At that moment, though, Everyone's eyes were shining like the sun 
until the sin of the golden calf. Now we know that Moses' face shone like the sun when he came down the mountain the second time. Now ask, why not the first time? Did God not write the first tablets himself on pieces of what is described as gleaming sapphire taken from his throne? Were the letters not engraved in fire and could be seen from both sides lifting them up in the air? It would seem much more appropriate for face shining, no? And what were the second tablets made of? The regular stone that Moses picked up. And the Lord said to Moses, Hew for yourself two stone tablets, like the first ones, only not you for yourself. You do this. And I will inscribe upon the tablets the words that were on the first tablets, which you broke. Again, if you think this is a sin on Moses' part, to the contrary. He actually saved Israel from complete annihilation by dropping it. But that's precisely why his face shone. It's because he did the work together with God. This is what it is. Moses worked together with God. You get the canvas, son, and I'll paint you a really pretty picture. And his face was like this for 40 years until he died. The children of Israel could have been close to the same level as Moses. Not on the same level, obviously, but closer, way closer than what they were. But they didn't do the work. While they kept on falling, he kept on picking them up. See, Moses was a constant. We'll get to that. And he did all this knowing that he wasn't getting into the land of Israel as we read a few weeks ago. When Joshua came and told him that two prophets are saying that Moses will die in the wilderness and that Joshua will lead the people in. Right there, he didn't oppose because he knew that it came from God. Okay, didn't stop him from doing what he had to do. This is when Moses received an increase of the Spirit to give to the 70 elders, as we learned last week, Datan and Aviram were among them. They were righteous in their own way. We also learned absolutely two weeks ago the very reason Moses did not enter into the land. And the reason is not because he hit a rock. We went forward to the book of Deuteronomy, to the recount of Moses. For Moses recounts the situation and he says there it is clear as day. Deuteronomy 1.35 If any of these men of this evil generation sees the good land which I swore to give to your forefathers, this is what he's telling the people, reminding them what happened 38 years ago, except Caleb the son of Yefune, he will see it and I will give him the land he trod upon. And a verse before that he mentions Joshua, of course and to his children, because he has completely followed the Lord. The Lord was also angry with me because of you, saying, Neither will you go there. He was angry with me because of you. He was angry with me by extension of you because I am responsible for you. My life is tied to your life. This is non-negotiable. This is the reason Moses did not enter. It says it right there. He was innocent. But it was because of his responsibility to the generation that he could not go on without them. So, go ahead now. Ask the question. And yes, of course I know what it says in our Parsha. Do you? Let's read. Numbers 20 verse 12. Well, we'll start with seven. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take the staff and assemble the congregation, you and your brother Aaron, and speak to the rock in their presence so that it will give forth its water. You shall bring forth water from the rock uh, and give the congregation and their livestock to drink. Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him. Moses and Aaron assembled the congregation in front of the rock and he said to them, Now listen, you rebels, can we draw water for you from this rock? Moses raised his hand and struck the rock with his staff twice, when an abundance of water gushed forth and the congregation and their livestock drank. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, since you did not have faith in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly to the land which I give them. Does this make any sense to anyone? Do you see connections here? Because I sure don't. So if you say that this is it, I will prove you wrong, but we don't have to do that right now. Well, actually, we do have to do that right now. Anyway, you're saying, oh, I know, because Moses disobeyed God. He said, talk to the rock, and he hit the rock, and that's what happened. It's a special hidden super secret rock meaning. Yeah, I know what it says, but do you? So, Numbers 21, the Lord said to Moses, make yourself a serpent and put it on a pole, and let whoever is bitten look at it and live. God said, 
עשה לך שרף. Make for yourself not a serpent, a seraph, a fiery angel. Moses made a copper snake and put it on a pole. And whenever a snake bit a man, he gazed upon the copper snake and live. Oh no, Moses disobeyed God again in the same parsha, no less. Maybe it was this reason that he didn't enter the land. What, the serpent doesn't have a super secret hidden meaning? Wait, I got another one for you. Numbers 27, 18. The Lord said to Moses, Take yourself, Joshua, the son of Nun, a man of spirit, and you shall lay your hand, one hand upon him. But then in verses 22 and 23, we read, dun, dun, dun. Moses did as the Lord commanded, and he took Joshua and presented him before Elazar the Kohen, before the entire congregation, and he laid his hands upon him and commanded him in accordance with what the Lord had spoken to Moses. No, one, not one hand, but both hands were laid. Oh, the humanity. Moses disobeyed God again. Maybe this is the reason why he didn't enter into the land of Israel. Come on now. None of these are the reasons that Moses did not enter into the land. The reason is given to us. Like, if it's so obvious, why are you arguing with that? I don't understand. The Lord was also angry with me because of you saying, neither will you go there. End of story. Why is everybody looking for all these twists and turns? You're asking the wrong questions. You're not learning anything by this. I'm here to teach you. Do you want to learn? Listen up. The question we should be asking is why is it this instance that God gives the decree which had already been decreed? How about that for a question? Moses knew he wasn't entering, but this, now this? No, no, now you're not going in. What? But he doesn't even say that. So listen, you see, it's very important to read everything and understand what is written and how it is written. Does the Torah say straight up, for instance, that Canaan, the son of Ham, raped his mother? No, it does not. And yet, that's what happened. I believe we discussed this in Parashat Noah. The Torah alludes to things. The Torah is the epitome also of, how should we say, yeah, of, of anava, basically, of humility, right? The Torah won't say things outright. So to say Noah was... The Mepharshim say that Noah was castrated by his son. How does one castrate one's son? And everybody alludes to it. And you have to look at everything to be like, oh, dude, that happened. Yes, that happened. But doesn't say it outright because there's still a little bit of humility left in the Torah. You see? Left, I say. So, if you want to see what you want to see, then you'll never see the truth. Now. Let's read what God says, and not what our own personal narrative says, okay? The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Since you did not have faith in me to sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring this assembly to the land which I have given them. So first, even in the pshat, the simplest text, we can understand that this has nothing to do with the rock. Did God say, since you hit the rock, when I said, speak to the rock, that you... No, he didn't say that. So again, we can dismiss this. These words were never said. So we should understand that there is something greater here at play by default. What? God wasn't glorified before the children of Israel? When they cried out, and Moses hit the rock, and every last man, woman, and child, and all their livestock were watered? That's not a gigantic miracle? Come on. My friends, what we're seeing here might just be a classic case of entrapment. Who knows? Moses knew he wasn't going to enter. Joshua knew it. Aaron and Miriam knew it. And since the two prophets were yelling it there in the streets, I'm sure at this point all of Israel knew it. God just came to Moses and said, Ha ha ha, gotcha, now you're not going in. Uh, but did he? We must always understand that everything that is written here is more than just a story, more than just laws, more than just secrets, but rather ways to elevate who we are for the sake of unifying with our Creator, thereby rectifying all of creation in the process. This goes from the smallest 
simplest act of kindness, holding an elevator door for someone. This is a mitzvah, all the way up to physically building the temple. It's all the same work for the sake of heaven and it's all necessary. Just like each and every one of us is necessary because here we are breathing. That's why it's vital that you never be satisfied with just one answer or interpretation. And of course, again and again, I say, always consider your source. I'm going to tell you one more thing, though. The conclusion to this question as to why here, why now, why him, it's inconclusive, and yet that's completely irrelevant. We can only review all the facts and have an idea. The idea that speaks to you might be different than the idea that speaks to your fellow man. But that's the point. Seventy faces, my friends. Shivim panim la Torah. If we read the Torah with those kind of glasses, we'll be okay. And not to mention understand a whole lot more than if we read it with an agenda. Right? This is the whole point of learning the Torah. This happened because this. Okay, done. Moving along. What can we learn from that? Zero. Right? Okay, you understand. So first, let's take those two, three, four, five thousand steps back and look at the big picture. Did God frame Moses? Let's find out. First of all, this is the first time Moses brought water forth from the rock to the people? No, no, it's not. How did he bring water the first time that God told him to bring it? In other words, hey, deja vu, we've been here before. Let's read Exodus 17. This is right after they crossed through Yam Suf. The sea split. They saw all of creation. They saw the beginning, the end, the cosmos, the heavenly hosts. They saw everything. They saw more when the sea split than what they did on Mount Sinai. The entire community of the children of Israel journeyed from the desert to sin to their travels by the mandate of the Lord. They encamped in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. <clears throat> Speaking of which, I'm a little thirsty. So the people quarreled with Moses, and they said, Give us water that we may drink. Moses said to them, Why do you crawl? What do you want? Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? You just saw what happened. Are you serious right now? The people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses, and they said, Why have you brought us up? And remember who the people were, right? They were Datan and Aviram. Why did you bring us up, Mimitzrayim, to bring Lehamit Oti Ve'et Banai, to make me and, my, it says, my sons and my livestock die? Not all the people said it. Moses cried out to the Lord saying, What shall I do for this people just a little longer and they will stone me? They're about to kill him. And the Lord said to Moses, Pass before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand your staff with which you struck the Nile. Asher hikitabo etayo kach be'ad chav ve'alachta and go. Behold, I shall stand there before you on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock. Oh, look, Moses, take your staff, strike the rock, and water will come out and the people will drink. Moses did so before the eyes of the elders of Israel. He named that place Masa, testing, and Merivah, quarreling, because of the quarrel of the children of Israel and because of their testing the Lord, saying, Is the Lord in our midst or not? Okay. So, this was Moses' first and last encounter with bringing water to the people when it came to a rock, since Miriam took up those duties shortly after. Miriam was their source of water. So Moses, who was a mortal man, a very awesome, powerful, and the most humble man, yet a man nonetheless, this was his experience with the children of Israel and water right after they experienced the splitting of the sea and what went down there. And we know by default that they were on such a low point here after this happened, because in the very next verse, who comes into the picture? Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim, right there, right after this happened. Now, throughout history, Amalek attacks Israel either when we are divided or when we are spiritually weak. How do we know this? They attack the stragglers, the weak points, physically, and also your spiritual weakness. 
They come as temptations when you're lax. The points in your life that you are your weakest, they will be attacked and tested by the spirit of Amalek. And what is the purpose of Amalek? It's to separate us from God by any means necessary. Now, I'm just reminding you again about Amalek because it's a mitzvah to do so. So right now we are all sharing in a mitzvah. As it says in Deuteronomy 25, 17, you shall remember what Amalek did to you on the way when you were out of Egypt, when you went out of Egypt. What did he do? How he happened upon you on the way and cut all the stragglers at your rear when you were faint and weary and he did not fear God. That's it. He was just doing his job, right? This is, that's his opening right there. When you're weak and he can only attack if you invite him. Build your walls strong and fortify them with truth, not with agenda, not ego, and not feelings. Because that's like driving through a safari with a, you know, in a convertible, all right? It's most likely not going to end well for you. Anyway, all this happening here right now, this is all fresh in the mind of Moses. And speaking of Miriam, now let's fast forward 40 years, because this just happened 40 years later. Here we go. Chapter 20, verse 1. The entire congregation of the children of Israel arrived at the desert of Tzin in the first month, and the people settled in Kadesh. Miriam died there and was buried there. Moses and Aaron just buried their sister. What happens in verse 2? The congregation had no water, so they assembled against Moses and Aaron? Let's get into Moses' head now for a minute, or let's at least try to understand the psychology of the situation, because we can't exactly get into his head. We're not even there, but let's put ourselves there, shall we? One of the greatest prophets to have ever lived just left the world. It was in her merit that the rock brought forth water. And another, by the way, what your English Bibles won't tell you is that back in Exodus, the rock was called a tzu, and here it's called a sela. But you'll just read it as a rock, okay? So this, is, this one had meaning, and that one had meaning. But everything has meaning, so... That's not really saying much. So Miriam dies, and the whole and the and the whole uh, world had just lost out on one of the trifecta that was Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, and it showed because when she died, the water stopped, just like we'll see when Aaron died, the clouds of glory disappeared, and that's when we see Amalek attack Israel. Because he thought, hey, I see a gap right there. Our enemy knows when we're good and when we're exposed. But we'll get to that a little bit later. So Moses, who was way up here, okay? This is where Moses lives. He's here. Everybody else is like, kind of like, this. this is Moses. He is a constant, like I said. He was just brought way down emotionally, not spiritually, but emotionally speaking, because of the death of his sister. You have no idea what kind of bond these two had. We've learned that it was because of Miriam that Moses was even born. He and Aaron are mourning her loss. But then again, you have several million people right now to water. They, they're your responsibility. And many millions more of their livestock. So Moses was understandably upset and went and did what he did last time. He hit the rock. Now, there are hundreds of interpretations here. Mamash, a hun hundreds of interpretations. Everybody's got an opinion, and they're all fantastic as to exactly what happened. But as I mentioned before, they're all inconclusive. And that's okay, too. Welcome to Judaism. We know already from the text that this is absolutely not why Moses did not enter into the land. We already have established this. And now let's see why God chose this instance specifically to not only tell Moses that he wasn't going to enter, but also that Moses would not be forgiven. What? 
As we read in the future that Moses prayed to God several hundred prayers in Parashat Vaitchanan, I, I beg, I beseech the Lord to let me in, but he said no. We'll, we'll talk about that. We spoke about it last year, we'll talk about it again. But God wouldn't forgive him. Come on. I need to use these because I need you to understand that God does not go against his own word. We know this, okay? God doesn't change his word, just like Israel is God's firstborn son. That means God's firstborn son is Israel. That means there was no firstborn son before the firstborn son. There's only his firstborn son. You only get one firstborn son, and that's Israel. You see what I'm saying? Okay. So, and if God says... When you do teshuva, you are forgiven, right? So what? Moses didn't know how to do teshuva? God refused to forgive him? That's absolutely absurd if you believe that. Now, I mentioned the real reason why in the teachings of the death of Moses. Of course, God would forgive Moses, but that's not why he didn't enter. God never told Moses that he would enter from the beginning. He told him that he would take them out of Egypt and lead them to the promised land. Okay, so right here, there was a pause, okay? I'm letting you in on something. There was a pause in my study right when I got to this point. I'm like, wait a minute, okay. Something just hit me, stared me in the face all along. Now, I'm just going to say it here, and those that have an ear will hear. But don't worry, this is going to be brought up again within the relevant context in the near future, God willing. Moses was never supposed to enter into the land of Israel. He was never supposed to enter. God showed him what would happen if he would have entered. Moses was the greatest man to have ever lived. And if he were to enter, he would have beelined it right to Mount Moriah, burning anyone who stood in his way, and he would have built the third temple. Yes, the third temple. The third temple comes from up there. How do you build it? Not with stuff, but with stuff. Okay. That which cannot be destroyed. And we know that only Mashiach ben David is to build the third temple, right? Was Moses from the seed of David? Was there even a David? It was not the right time because the people were still not where they were supposed to be. Two temples had to be destroyed. Five exiles had to take place. Things have to happen. And if Moses would have entered, he would have destroyed everything. He was too powerful and the world was not ready for his power at that time. Because he was only, <clears throat> it was only when God showed Moses that the rest of the children of Israel who would have entered would perish, of course, along with the rest of the world, since they were not ready. That's when he backed off. He said, Rav Lecha, enough. Let me show you what happens if you enter. And he saw, he's like, all right, fine. That's when he asked God, hey, can you even bring my corpse into the land? God said, no, he's still too powerful. We don't know where Moses is buried today. Why? Because they'd be building shrines all around him. They might even be worshiping his grave. Just like you're never supposed to worship a man, for goodness sakes. He was almost out of this world while he was still in this world. And still, it was in the merit of Moses that water came out of the rock. Hello, miracle. And again, after Aaron passed, who was beloved by everyone because he was a man of peace. Moses was the man of law. That's why they gave him the trouble. In Aaron's merit, the clouds of glory stood. They were covering Israel. It was Israel's protection from the sun during the... Uh, a period of the wilderness. And after he died, they returned only for Moses' sake. So now Moses was carrying the load of Aaron and of Miriam. The trifecta is no more. And now once again, it's all on his shoulders. So, did God frame Moses? And not exactly. But God knew that eventually Moses would choose the people over the land, which is exactly what happened. Because what good is the chosen land without the chosen people? Right? Furthermore, we can understand that out of all the times that Moses interceded for the people, seemingly change, changing God's mind, or when he <clears throat> supposedly disobeyed God, that we don't understand everything. 
And that's the purpose of chukat, to begin with, our parsha. It's a command that makes no sense, a chukah. It makes no sense and is not given an explanation, and yet you take it just like the ones that do make sense, because they came from the same source. Now the Ramban, Maimonides, uh, Nachmanides, excuse me, he says that the Satan, now everybody's perking up Satan, okay, that the Satan, as well as the rest of the nations, are going to ask, what's this good for? Ah, you don't even understand it. What are you doing? The things you... Eh, that doesn't make sense. You don't have to do it. That's why God gave them specifically to Israel. Because the nations will not understand. That's why you have people trying to interpret this for themselves as well as everything else in the Torah. And new religions are born from it. Oh yeah, it's because of this. And if Satan is sitting on top of those derogatory questions in order to mock and ridicule the Jews... Go look at the people who do the same, and then you know which God they serve. But we can see this again throughout the Torah, based on Moses' actions that seem to be different from the words of God. What do you read? Like what you read and what, what exactly happens is not 100%. Why? Why? God says this and Moses does it a little bit differently. We, our sages, like Moses, have to translate the spiritual reality into the physical. Moses' head was literally in the clouds, okay? He went up there, but his feet were on the ground. It says, Mamash, that the top half of his body, he was angelic, and the bottom half, he was human. He was, like I said, he was almost not here, but he was. We see, we see this, for instance, with the building of the Mishkan. God showed Moses four pillars. I've, I keep bringing this example because it's classic. Okay, the whole, the whole building of the Mishkan was something spiritual. <clears throat> but in this particular instance, God showed Moses four pillars of fire made of four colors, red, white, black, and green. Just like the four horsemen of the apocalypse in Zechariah chapters 1 and 6. Points of origin. How does one build something in the physical world that cannot exist in this realm? God gave him the earthly physical substitute. Take this and this and this, put that together. That is the physical equivalent of what you just saw. Same thing with the seraph and the snake in our parsha. Make for yourself a seraph and put it on the pole. Make for yourself. You do this. Moses, according to how you see fit, you see this in the spiritual realm. Make it so in the physical. You know how to do it now, right? Moses is like, yeah, I know how to do it. Thanks, God. Now I'm, I'm putting my big boy pants on right now. This is how we're supposed to do. You obviously can play, you can't place a fiery angel upon a pole, now can you? But you'll figure it out. Yes, I will. The same goes for the placing of the two hands upon Joshua instead of the one hand, which God specifically said so. Okay, one is for anointing, the other one's for responsibility. But we can't ignore the fact that it says Moses did as the, as the Lord had commanded him. He laid his hands upon him and commanded him in accordance with what the Lord had spoken to Moses. You see? But you think Moses, what, disobeying God left and right so easily you say this? Watch who you're speaking of. You see, you have to be very, very careful to challenge Moses, especially or the sages, and dismiss their words or their actions so easily. They speak the word of God and understand it in the way that you or I or anyone else alive today could not even begin to comprehend. And why do you think they did all this? What, you think that they didn't know that the heavens have a magnifying glass on them? And God forbid they make a wrong decree that's not according to the Torah, where you think they loosely said, do this, or this means this, or this means that. And you come along and you're like, oh, you know what? Nah. Nah, I don't, okay, okay, hey, that's on you, but we're here to learn. Because if you truly want to know how to use this book called the Torah, you need divine commentary by our sages. Otherwise, I refer you back to Parashat Mishpatim, an eye for an eye, and by all means, go grab the sharpest knife you got in your kitchen and circumcise your own heart. Because that's what it says, literally. Lucky our sages came along and said, no, that's not exactly what it means. Psalms 115.16, the heavens, 
The heavens are heavens of the Lord, but the earth he gave to the children of men. Hashamayim shamayim laadonai, ve'aretz natan livne adam. We can only do the very best that we can do with the tools that we have been given. It's not going to look... Uh, it's not going to look like it does in heaven, obviously, because it's not supposed to look like it does in heaven. It's supposed to be the physical image of the spiritual image, the spirit manifesting in the physical. You get what I'm saying, right? All right, but anyway, one more. Deuteronomy 30, verse 12. It is not in heaven that you should say, what? This mitzvah, the word of God, the Torah, who will go up to heaven to fetch it for us? to tell it to us so that we can fulfill it. And that was Moses who already did that. So now we have no more excuses. Do we understand now how important it is to dig deeper? You see, instead of looking elsewhere, dig deeper. Instead of asking random people for their opinion or going by your own opinion, dig deeper. That's what all these books and many others are for. You don't have to drown in them, okay? Focus on the Torah, read the Torah, read the Pshat, learn the Hebrew, then start working with Rashi, then maybe Rambam, and so on and so forth, and you grow from there. Once you have a foundation, then you expand, and it blows your mind. But if you think you have a conclusive answer to something, you are robbing yourself. This is what I'm saying. You're like, oh, there's the answer. I know the answer. Done. That's it. What did you gain from that? You gained nothing. Remember, it's not about coming to the answer. It's the whole journey. We discuss this plenty of times. Where was I? Sorry. Okay. The, it's, the time is about here. Is about what we're doing over here. Now, you're going to have to take it or you're going to have to leave it. Because I, I do this too often. I know I do. But it, again, the, so the, the take what I leave it, though, it's, and I'm also going to explain that. But in any case, this is not going to happen that much more often. It's just going to have to be like, this is how it is, and that's it. You don't, you don't like me? Go elsewhere. It's, it's okay. It's cool. But again, we're, we're here to learn. So back to our question. Now that we've ha- ruled out all the other narratives. See, we ha- I have to do this. I just wasted 42 minutes almost expl- like canceling everything out by the process of elimination just to make a point. But this point will serve you well. And if you take this point and apply it to everything else in the Torah, you can actually learn something. So I do this for 42 hours if I had to. All right? Okay. No regrets. No take backs. Let's look at the positive instead of the negative, and then we can understand. To the why did God choose this specific transgression to tell Moses he wasn't entering? Now, this is a thought that has been brought in from everything that we've learned today. If you've listened to everything, you'll understand this. If you've been paying attention, if you've read the Parsha, as well as if you've been with us for a while, you really may just get it. Now, this one was for the people's sake. I mean, this one in the Parsha, this was done for the people's sake. God used Moses as he... He, as he is right to do so, to elevate the children of Israel who were about to enter into the land. Moses didn't screw up when he did what he knew how to do, which was hit the rock for water. God said, speak, okay, so I hit the rock for water, but really what's the big deal? Okay, God taught Moses and by extension us a very valuable lesson here. Verse 10. Moses and Aaron assembled the congregation in front of the rock, and he said to them, Now listen, you rebels. Okay. The Hebrew says, Shim'u lishmo, shim'u na, please listen. Hamorim, hamina sela ze notzilachem maim? Sela, rock, it's not, but whatever. Hamorim, oddly enough, in modern day Hebrew means the teachers. More is teacher, morim, teachers, plural. Also, exactly, it's the same spelling as Miriam. Wouldn't you know? So, read this again. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, this is verse 7, Take the staff. Okay, got the staff. Why would God specifically tell him to take the staff if he was not to use the staff? Verse 9, Moses took the staff from before the Lord as he had commanded him. He took the staff. Moses and Aaron assembled the, con- assembled the congregation. He said what he said. Verse 11, he raised his hand, he struck the rock, he did what he did. 
but how did he use the staff? Take the staff, but don't use the staff? Mm. I'll give you a little hint. It's in the title. Even when I walk in the, in the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Moses used the staff, take the staff, as a rod. Now, if you've missed this teaching, we actually discussed this in the past, I'm sorry, I can't remember where, that a staff and a rod, they're the same stick, right? It all depends on how you use it. A staff leads from the front and guides from the back, while a rod smacks from the top. It's whack, whack, right? When the Hebrew said, Vayach et hasela, it comes from the word maka, Vayach, ka, maka. Also can be compared to Exodus 2.12, back to Moses. He turned this way, turned that way. He saw that there was no man, so he struck the Egyptian. Same word, vayfen kovako, vayre ki ein ish, vayach et hamitzri, vayach et asela. Aseret hamakot, the ten strikes. But for some reason we translate in English to the ten plagues, which in Hebrew would be called magefa. Plague is magefa. Aseret hamagefot. But it wasn't plagues, it was makot. Specifically they're called makot. So he called them rebels, and he used the staff as a rod. Now don't get me wrong, I fully believe in correcting your child with a rod when necessary. It doesn't mean that the parents don't love the children, it just means that the child did something so foolish that if they don't get that smack, could eventually harm them. When does the shepherd use his rod? When the sheep is willful, does not adhere to the guiding staff and is about to walk off a cliff. Wake up, snap out of it. You wanna see what an entire generation that have been spared the rod due to political correctness looks like? Turn on your TV or look out your window wherever you are, but yeah, straight up. Their parents already missed the opportunity, but God still has a rod, don't worry, and that thing is coming down right now and you do not want to be around when it hits. He who holds back his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him early, as in, be, ah, 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 ah. if you do that, it's not gonna be good. Better this than uh, that. That rod was used to discipline Egypt, and that rod was used to discipline the children of Israel for 40 years. It was a staff used as a rod. But the time for smacking the children of Israel was over. And why? Did they not just rise up against Moses and Aaron, just as they did 40 years ago? So what changed? Again, let's start with the process of elimination. One, did God change? Of course not. God never changes. Did Moses change? Of course not. He was who he was until the end. Remember, Moses lives up here. Here we go. And he died right here. Three, did the scenario change? Thirsty, complaining, rock, water, hmm, same scenario. So that didn't change. In fact, it would seem that almost the exact same situation had been set up for the children of Israel to go through it again. That's called a tikkun, kids. So what changed? The people changed. These were not the same children of Israel who left Egypt who sinned at Masan and Meribah, who sinned with the golden calf, who sinned with the spies, who sinned with Korach. That was 38 years ago, son. These are their kids-ish, the next generation, who learned from the previous generation's mistakes. And as a result, they are no longer kids, nor should they, nor should they be treated as such. Sometimes you need to use your words and not just mm, ah, talk to me. Tell me what's up. Gotcha. This is the generation that God deemed worthy of entering the land of Israel. They were all grown up and they were all grown up. Hold on now. Grown ups make mistakes too, you know. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What? You think just because you know what to do that you do it? Or you think that just because you know what not to do that you don't do that? You think that just because they were grown-ups that they don't whine and complain and act like spoiled brats sometimes? I do. 
I mean, I, I do. But it's not about how we act because we all act like this from time to time. Hopefully not all the time, but you know, it happens. Just like we all sin all the time. But it's about taking responsibility and owning it and learning from it. It's about knowing who you are and using that. It's about coming into your fullness and understanding the process of submission, obedience, and humility, all the while understanding the correction process through humility, sub obedience, and submission. And how do we know this? We see this at least twice come into fruition in this Parsha. This is right after Aaron dies. The Canaanite king of Arad, who lives in the south, heard that Israel had come by the route of the spies, and he waged war against Israel and took from them a captive. We're not going to get into that details, but who was this Canaanite king? This was Amalek, and how do we know this? 1329. Back, the uh, numbers 1329. Chapter 13, verse 29, the incident with the spies. The Amalekites dwell in the Southland. The Canaanite king of Arad, who lived in the South. And what did he hear? That they were coming close? No. That's for the same people who think that this is why Moses didn't enter the land. The whole world had their eyes on Israel. And just as they do today, nothing has changed. Especially not Amalek. And when they saw that the clouds of glory, which acted as their protection, had left them due to Aaron's death, which they didn't necessarily know about, they said, Aha! They must be vulnerable. Let's go get them. So, what does this prove? Well, nothing yet. Give me a minute so we could keep reading. Verse 2. Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, if you, deliver the, if you deliver this people into my hand, I shall consecrate their cities. Israel is not Moses. Israel is not Joshua. Israel is not the 70 elders. Israel is all of Israel. Deliver this people into my hand. I, singular, one nation, one people, together, united, who came to their father and asked for help. Verse 3, the Lord heard Israel's voice and delivered the Canaanite. He destroyed them and consecrated their cities, and he called the place Chomra. Vaishma Adonai Bekol Israel. And God listened and did as they asked. Lekol, uh, Bakol, not Lekol. Meaning he didn't only hear them, uh huh, uh huh, okay, but he listened to them and he did it. <coughs> These are not the same people that Moses took out of Egypt who sinned at Masa and Meribah, who sinned with the golden calf, who sinned with the spice, who sinned with Korach. Even if they actually are the same ones, they have changed, they have grown, they have matured. We cannot even begin to comprehend the power that has been given to us when we unite as one. Okay, one more. One verse later, they're at it again. They journeyed from Mount Hor, by way of the Red Sea to circle the land of Edom, and the people became disheartened because of the way. Here's your staff. I'm going to lead you here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The people spoke against Mo uh, God and Moses, spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt? Da, 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 your usual shenanigans. Okay. The Lord sent against the people venomous snakes immediately. No time to waste. And they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. Here's your rod. Smack. Why? What? Wait for it. Verse 7, the next verse. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord. They sinned against the Lord and sinned against Moses. We have sinned against the Lord, and we have sinned against you. Oh, wow. Pray to the Lord that he remove the snakes from us or rather the snake. We did a whole study last year. So Moses prayed on behalf of the people. So, oh my goodness, did the people just realize the error of their ways and come to the proper order to ask for forgiveness from God and then Moses? Heal my children. The Lord said to Moses, make yourself a serpent and put it on a pole and let whoever is bitten look at it and live. Moses made a copper snake, we already discussed, put it on a pole and whenever a snake bit a man, he would gaze upon the copper snake and live, live, I say. 
The story, the law, the secret, the lesson is that there is a time for the rod and that there's a time for the staff. Even those who are Torah scholars can fall just like a person who doesn't know how to read or write. Because we are all people, we are human. Again, don't forget the concept of tshuva. We fall so we can get up. But if we recognize what is what, if we understand who we as individuals are and where we as individuals stand, which is part of something so much greater than our own individuality, and understand what comes, comes from God, then it'll help us to appropriately move according to the times and according to that we have as individuals are called to do, which is ultimately lead us back to Israel each person according to their own design. <sighs> and we have to be so conscious of this, especially since we're entering the most turbulent times in the history of the world, and we are meriting to see this. So, the rod or the staff, what do you want? Tell you what though, I'm gonna give you the answer to this. The correct answer is you absolutely want them both. So may all of Israel unite as one in the land of Israel, where we will merit to see the coming of Mashiach Tzidkenu in our day, in our time, right now. All right, so thank you so much for joining me. Have a wonderful rest of the week and have a Shabbat Shalom. Bye-bye.